complicated. If there's a big boulder where there should be a, a groundwork or something, you, you remove the boulder. And th this, is, this is the way America was uh, rebuilt between 16 and 20. But then, then in this same period, February, March 2020, the pandemic was, the pandemic was put in place, or whether you believe it was real, or, uh, however your point of view on that. Uh, but definitely it was, it was being uh, used to prepare for a stolen election or election fraud, or uh, there, there were millions of unsolicited absentee ballots being sent out uh, during that time. And, and I thought that there needed to be political action to meet that nose to nose, that th there needed to be political action to meet that nose to nose and to, to stop that eventuality. But instead, he was, he was arguing with Jim Acosta, and uh, uh, I, I, didn't see, I didn't see his reflexes on this matching everything else about him in his governance. And, and that's, when, that's when I started to get almost, almost sick with fear, and that's the basis of the, that's when I set out to set, establish the settlement project. So, so uh, the things that make the settlement project are my own personal makeup, the pandemic initiated a preparation of election fraud or election meddling or how, whichever adjective <laughs> you, know, you wanna, uh, and then, and then a lot flooded into me on, and this is important what I'll get into in a moment, the new alliance attack on Americans' divine origins. Uh, a strong voice of mine is that it's not simply Marxism. A huge part of what the settlement project exists to say is that it is no longer simply Marxism. And I'll get to that toward the, uh, uh, toward the end of this. And this is quite brief. So my international background is this weird combo that I mentioned of being international peace-seeking and American patriotism. It's just an odd mix. I happen to be. The international peace-seeking caused me to know as a fact that people at war can stop being at war. I've done it a lot of times in my life. I've been involved in Israel and Palestine. I've been involved in South Africa. I've been involved with terrorists in southern Philippines. I, I, I met the guy in the jungle, the head of Abu Sayyaf, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I believe uh, basically war and conflict is the way to destroy a land. It's the way to, to remove prosperity from existence. And, and if America remains in conflict, it, it will be destroyed. The, the good guys, we, cannot just win. So settlement, settlement means that the pendulum stops swinging. It isn't sometimes the right wind, sometimes the left wind. We have no more swings left. And so, and so the other little quip on the issue of settlement is that Americans are born to be free. Our founders recognized that by being born, you're free. We're, we're created, we're created. Our freedoms come from having a creator. This is what our founders and framers know. And so freedom and equality, our equality comes from having a creator, both those things. And that's all what an American is. It's a person who's free by, birth, by being born and equal by being born. It doesn't come from anyone or anything other than from God. And so I thought to myself, you're, no one is free if someone is, is plotting your demise. And so the American circumstance is that our freedoms are always under threat because enemies are plotting to destroy us. And so the idea of settlement is that things get settled, that the healthy, godly, family-oriented people operate in an environment and in, and in a circumstance that is settled so we can really start to build and not just be in a fight constantly. It holds us back. Um, so that's where my international peace-seeking knowledge and experience and confidence comes as, uh, as one of the pillars or thoughts of settlement. And the other thing is my American patriotism, which uh, I guess it just comes from God. It didn't come 
from my folks, you know, uh, you know, uh, New York German Jew, you know, that I should have been raised a communist, you know, you know, back in the 50s, you know, or, you know, where did it come from? My mom's from Calcutta, India, she was in the United Nations, I went to the United Nations school, so uh, this creation ex nihilo, or creation of a patriot ex nihilo for some reason. So I just wanted to show um, that Carl wasn't making things up. There's me in India. Um, oh, oh wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's me with a Shiite Muslim. There's me with his holiness. I, w I went to tell him, you know, I should have won. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, here's me with Bishop Desmond Tutu. So uh, I just wanted to, I put those pictures in just so that, um, uh, oh, I'm hitting the wrong arrow. Okay. All right. So. So that's, so that's part of one thing, the, my, this uh, part of what makes up the settlement, is my background, and uh, which is these combination of two things. And then the circumstantial background in which settlement was, uh, is built and is being built and is, I'm so thrilled to see you, you have no idea. I'm so happy to be in your presence. I've met some of you just very recently and it's a thrill for me and I look forward to, and I hear about you from all my colleagues who have invited you. And so the circumstantial background is there's a new enemy alliance uh, that is not plain Marxism. And as long as we keep calling it Marxism, we will be laughed at by the intellectual elite progressive left. They will, they will think we're fools and they'll, they'll go home shaking their head at the kind of archaic Neanderthalic knuckle dragging. We have to we have to know philosophically what is the nature of what we're fighting. And then on our side, and this is a little harsh, I hope no one's offended, but there's, the defenses on our side need to be re-bolstered, I believe. Spiritual and moral confusion and surrender. We talked about that last night, Adele, we, uh, toward the end of the night, that where are we going to find people that that are morally clear and willing to, willing to uh, say so. Uh, we have to get to the point where we're not just trying to be polite and good company constantly. Um, and also, that's on the spiritual side, on the religious side. There's, there's confusion morally. There's too much, too much compromise, too much unclarity between what's right and wrong spiritually, in my opinion, spiritually and religiously. And then on the political side, there's an exact mirror of that, which emerged as the uniparty, which we eventually came to discover in this time of crisis, that the difference between conservatives and uh, that Republicans and Democrats, we find them without a reliable voting record. Even though we fight hard to get principal Republicans into, into a power. And I believe that the Freedom Caucus in, uh, in the Congress are going like wildfire, I'm, I'm thrilled. So I'm not anti uh, the political process, but um, what had happened while we slept, while we slept, the uniparty arose and we found out that a lot of what uh, President Trump uh, finally named as rhinos, or maybe it's not his term, but we came to know that just as a term of art, which is a true thing. So both spiritually and politically, there, there's the lack of clarity. Okay, so this one of the things that the Settlement Project seeks to address. Uh, the original enemy, Marxism-Leninism, it, it had its greatest authority and power in the Soviet Union. China was a little weaker in the 20th century, if I'm accurate on that. Uh, uh, would you say is that uh, in the 20th century, the Soviet Union was, uh, was stronger militarily and economically? Um, and basically, dialectical materialism is uh, it's a it's an economic theory. Uh, well, no, no, that's an ontological theory, and historical materialism is a philosophy of history theory. But basically, communism was an economic theory, and the enemy was anybody that's well-to-do, anybody that's it's going okay for, and the victim and the oppressed are the uh, proletariat, the working class. It's an ec economic theory, and you have a clear enemy. Basically, anybody who's rich, anybody who's invested in capitalism, in corporate uh, life, et cetera. 
That's the full extent of Marxism, and they tried to take over the world using an economic theory based on resentment, vengeance, and violence. The other aspect of uh, Marxism is violence as reform. That's what dialectical materialism means, violence as reform. And violence as reform means um, win at any cost, ends justify the means. These, these are the characteristics of communism. I believe that God, quote unquote, God's side won. I believe that God's side won. Reagan, Thatcher, Pope John Paul II, the Soviet Union fell and collapsed, and Marxism as a political theory and ideology was overcome by free market capitalism and a country founded in God. But for the last 30 years, something has happened in which we wake up to find that whatever that was is not only nowhere near gone, but worse than we had ever imagined. And so uh, I'll explain a little bit what I, what I regard to be what I call a new enemy alliance that we can't merely call Marxism anymore. The CCP is entirely Marxist, but it's, it's Maoist. It's Maoist. It is a, it is a, a different basis of perpetrating the violent overthrow of, the, of any class that's deemed the enemy. Uh, we, I, I'm a little bit reluctant because I know uh, Ms. Van Fleet uh, is a genius on this matter and we'll hear from this more deeply. But, and, and please shout out if I'm wrong because I, I, I have not, I've said this but not in the presence of deeply knowledgeable people. The, the, the Soviet-American war ended up as a classic European-style war. You get all your horses and men on this side, you get all your horses and men on this side of the football field, and somebody shoots off the starting gun, and you go to war. It's like nose-to-nose, -nose, face to face, only it was nuclear weapons. We have, we have a thousand nuclear weapons, you have a thousand nuclear weapons, now we're at war, face to face, war to war. And then you have your spies and things like that. I believe that Maoism, neo-Maoism, the, uh, the current version of overthrowing the enemy is you never, and, and here's where I'm asking your help, you never stand in front of your enemy. The, the, the China CCP manner of winning, of destroying the enemy is never stand in front of the enemy. The enemy is destroyed, it's a death by a thousand cuts, death by a thousand cuts. It's almost like that X-Men movie where the person's never in front of you. He's, behind, he, he, he's here, he's there, he's here, he's there. Uh, and, and this is why America uh, funded, funded uh, the CCP in order to bring it up to the power in which it really threatens American uh, 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 security and status. Okay. And then another thing is, this is, not, this is not the progressive left, but it is a form of anti-God materialism, which I call the, the WEF, World Economic Forum. It, it, believe, it doesn't, uh, it's built on the fact that it denies that humans have a soul from God. As long as you, if you don't have a soul from God, you can be enhanced with chips, you can be given AI, you can, be, you can be changed from a man to a woman. Uh, you're just a big material, it's, it's a form of materialism. It's a form of Marxism, but it's materialism. And so transhumanism is, is uh, ad advanced. Surveillance capitalism, surveillance totalitarianism is advanced. And, and I'll get into that a little later, but these are the three elements that make up the current new enemy alliance by, in my view, and that's what I believe that we're, we gather, we get to know one another, we start to work together, and we keep holding these meetings and keep working together, supporting each other in order to create a collective stand against this collection of activity. Uh, I already described that. The race, what, what Marxism morphed into passed through race and gender ideology faculties in uh, universities across the Western world. Race and gender ideologies do not grow out of Hegelian Marxist uh, dialectical materialism. What it grows out of is the French language theorists that undermined 
the ability to, de to say anything as true. There's nothing is true. There's only, it used to be only my point of view and, and your point of view. But now it's, n now it's come to not even a point of view because points of view can be discussed. Robin, do, is the flag to my right or to my left? Well, from, my po from your point of view, it's to my left. From my point of view, it's to my right. Um, we can discuss a point of view. But now, now, truth has even been further diminished to how I feel. How I feel. So, and so, the assault on truth is the final blow against the possibility of establishing any sort of sound social reality, especially something like the United States of America. You can't even get to God. You can't even get to the founders because nothing, nothing is true. Nothing is true. That's why, like, that's why these people, they fly into epileptic fits over being misgendered because I feel like this gender or that or one that I've not yet heard of yet. And so, and so it's, it's the French language theorists that have generated and developed uh, standpoint theory and identity theory. Standpoint theory, I don't know if anybody saw Vivek interviewed by Don Lemon, his last interview, before Lemon, you know, off he goes. You know. But uh, uh, Vivek tried to present a historical, a historical fact, a simple historical fact. And Lemon said, uh, you, how can you tell a black man something that you're calling a fact? And the, the, the um, what do you call it? The uh, uh, interview broke down. It just couldn't go any further. Uh, Vivek was forbidden to have a point of view about American history because it affected blacks in America. Uh, of course, points of view are needed. That's the beauty of life. We need to learn from each other. And I'm sure Vivek would have been happy to learn that this may be a fact, but it's not the way black people have experienced it. We have, that's a good conversation. Okay, sorry, I'm going on too long. Okay, so, um, so standpoint theory, identity theory, uh, these, these are new in what we're fighting. And now, now you don't have the bourgeoisie is not your enemy. You know who's, in, who's my enemy? A white guy. You know who's my enemy? A male. You know who's my enemy? Somebody, somebody who's, who dares to actually have a child. Oh my God, he's cis, you know, cis. Uh, so, so now you don't have an economic theory of a bourgeoisie and a proletariat. Still you have everything is oppression, that's Marxist. Still you have violence is the answer, that's Marxist, yes. So all the champions we have, the Mark Levins, you know, the, uh, the great speakers, they're, they're calling it Marxist. It is Marxist, but it is so infused and it has adopted standpoint theory so that everything is my enemy. Someone that, someone that looks, looks at me in a bathing suit and says, hey, fella, is, you know, has like, is the enemy of humankind. And the result of the, resu the, Mar the Marxist praxis is enemies must be removed. They're causing harm in the world. So we're actually we're actually on the brink of gulags, extermination, uh, literally. You, you, it, to be an honorable and noble person, you must remove what harms a poor lady like Carl. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my, what, no. So you understand, it's, it's, my, it's, my, it's, my, it's my need to save the oppressed. Uh, but now the oppressed is everywhere. You have a perfect, uh, a perfect circumstance, and and we have to, we have to finally define it clearly, unite better than we ever have before, and um, that's what Settlement Project is all about. So, uh, so here's finally what I recommend, and I realize I must have gone very long because I uh, went off on a lot of tangents today. But I, I thank you very much for listening. Um, here's the things that, that what we do and why we do it. I, I'm, re I'm advocating or recommending or hoping we are capable of having a broader interreligious solidarity. 
everybody who's genuinely religious are, are our allies. And religions tend to be in silos or tend to be uh, parochial. And uh, like Muslims probably don't feel that comfortable at a lot of Christian meetings or vice versa. Uh, there is a history of struggle among the religions. But among the vast numbers of both groups, you'll, you'll not find a better ally on the issue of two-parent families and raise your children and respect your elders and go to school and do your studies and, and then Muslims. And uh, although I spoke you know, on, the, on the China issue, Chinese spirituality, if China were not, if China were not kind of under the um, demonic yoke of the CCP, the family, the family assumptions of, uh, based in Chinese spirituality are, are glorious. These are the types of, so, so the interreligious solidarity must, we must grow better at that. We, we need every ally we can now, and a solid, uh, what's it called, a unified front. And then the same mirror, we need the same broad political mindedness, because the right side or the conservative side, the constitutional side, we, we act on principle. We, we pray. We study scripture. Um, and so principle is important to us. And what, by acting on principle, it's easy, to, it's easy to divide, easy to divide from the, from the next person. Because just being a little off really troubles, troubles me. You know, somebody who's a little off. The, the progressive left side it's not principle, it's winning. These are, these are different orientations. That's why they're able to vote as a block on everything. Nobody differs more than them. As soon as they get power, they start killing each other off like mad. Uh, but they vote as a block to win. So, so we have to find a way to retain our radical individualism, our radical commitment to principles and still be broad enough to create a unified front. So both religiously and politically, we, uh, the Settlement Project advocates greater solidarity across the board. Uh, so what did I say? A genuine, a genuine mutual embrace, support, and encouragement, the 11th Amendment squared. Broaden our base, broaden our base, broaden our base. Al allow others to be a little different from us now until we can, until we can turn back this terrible tide we're facing. And then, and then finally, uh, spiritual and moral courage. Let us, let, us get, let us get the basics of what we stand for and not be afraid to speak out about it. Virtue, self-discipline, family, patriotic love of country. We, we, need to, we need to have the capacity to peacefully and confidently assume that, that this is correct. There's, there's, there's no need to find anything other than that in our lives as Americans. Uh, we need the courage to stand for that. And then finally, the very last thing I'll say is that the work is compassion not, not violent hatred of those who are causing harm. So, for example, why are we why are we against open borders? Because we hate Mayorkas. I try not to hate Mayorkas. It's not easy. Uh, <laughs> I don't always succeed. But that's not why. That's not why I'm against open borders. I'm against open borders because people young. Teenagers with bright futures are dying by the, by the hundreds and thousands of, of fentanyl. If you, had, if you had one 14 year old girl sit with you for half an hour and, and tell of a journey being raped all throughout the journey, you couldn't stand it. You couldn't, sl you couldn't stand it. You'd beg her to stop talking. And this is happening by the tens. We're for, we're for law and order on immigration, not because we're mean people or we don't like Mexicans. Or we're, it's every, every bit of our political insistence 
our ideological insistence, our, our fight to the death for the right side, for God's side, for the Constitution, for the framers, for family, it's all out of, compa it's, it's a compassionate act. It's for people, it's always for, it's always for people. Why are we against CRT? Because it hurts minorities to an unimaginable degree that, that the ideal of American free market capitalism and, and the equality guaranteed in our Constitution, this is the arena in which every minority can flourish, that we can discover that all of our prejudices and all of our keeping this community down has hurt America to no end, that we haven't had the, the genius of the, of the black and African tradition, the genius of the Mexican tr and, and Latin American tradition. It's, pe it's uh, and, and I'll conclude, because now I'm just repeating. Our, our work is work of compassion. It's not work of, of defeating enemies. It's for people is why we do it. And so this is the, the nature and the mission of the Settlement Project. Um, I'm always encouraged by my friends to pitch for money, pitch, uh, and so the, the um, what is it? The um, website is here, and if, if you're moved, we need to uh, keep going strongly. Uh, you find donation buttons on the website, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what we do with that is the, the uh, conservative family, we're, we're, we've become quite strong uh, virtually. We have a good community. But these meetings, people need to meet each other, get each other's cards, meet each other face to face, and start to become locked arm in arm and work together. And we're, we're building chapters in every uh, state in the, in the country. And so we love to see, I love to see you. I'm grateful for the team that put this together. And I'm very, po very sorry to the moderator that I spoke quite long this morning. Thank you very much for your time. No, no, no. 12.30 is lunch, right? Yes, well, 11.30, 12.30 is our panel. Oh, oh our panel is 11.30. And so, and we're going to see some brief introductions around the room. So should we promise the people who would like to leave to have a, a little time now for Q&A if you'd like to ask them any questions or any, anything like that, if you have any questions or thoughts you want to share, this could be a good chance before we do our introductions and before we do our panel. If that's, if that's, that's fine with me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, well, first of all, if anyone had, had for Q&A with Frank, this is a chance to do that before we go into that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> so <laughs> right, uh, Chris Cloud, um, um, it's an honor. Uh, you mentioned, what I've jotted down here and note is that you, you mentioned the re uh, returning to uh, standards and, and, and our own set of morals and, our, and, and implementing that. And I've always maintained that the reason the opposition, and I choose my words very carefully, I don't call them the left, I don't call them Democrats, I don't call them Marxists, I call them the opposition. The reason the opposition behaves the way they do is twofold. We allow it, and their tantrums produce results. And they know that if they continue to throw tantrums and escalate that, eventually they'll wear us down like a parent, and we'll just go, fine, you can have that, but that's all. <laughs> And I've maintained, with, with, with due respect to humanity, a conservative mentality has to regain a modicum of belligerence. And what I mean by that is, when no is the shortest sentence in any language, we need to stand on moral principles and, and reject moral relativism. That's their earmark. If they can attack moral relativism, then transhumanism is just right around the corner. That's the, that paves the way. No merit, no no consequences. Um, regaining a modicum of belligerence will be. We're not accepting that behavior, and that's fine. And stand on that. And I think that would do culture and society and our country great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, there was another hand up right beside. Yeah. 
Uh, the brains of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Translated into something that you've stated and what he just said, just as a side note before I ask mine, is that um, when we were living overseas on islands and things, if you came to a pipe that was filled with holes and it's leaking, and mostly now in our society by design, mm. because it works for them and it harms us, the only way to bridge that with your paint work is building a new pipe that actually works. And people will funnel that way and say, no, we're not going to do that. And yes, this is the better answer. So building those bridges and gapping those distance, because people are so confused at this time. Yes. So having, as he would say just now, no, we're not doing this, because it is harmful to you and it's harmful to me, and bridging a new way. So my question for you is that you've started this. What I didn't hear was what what are you doing, besides bringing us together, what are some of the things you're aspiring to do to help us get from here to there? Yeah. Do you have some concrete examples of what you've done and what you plan to do? Sure. Uh, very quickly then, uh, we're, just at, we're just finally completing a book which explains in plain language the philosophical trajectory from Descartes to what we're experiencing now, so that when people stand in the face of the, the ideological assault, we speak intelligently, and then it starts to become more of a fair fight. So that book is just about to be finished, and I hope to work with uh, some of my colleagues to start converting those into um, uh, teaching presentations, like a series of slides that can be reproduced, can be taught everywhere in schools and so forth. So the first, first thing is to get, get, identify what we're fighting, and the counter proposal is quite clear and in plain language so that so that hoping to like kind of reproduce tens of thousands of uh, what's his name that Canadian genius uh, 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 Jordan Peterson yeah I want to create a, like your trucker Jordan Peterson all the way to your professor Jordan Jordan you know to to sound for all of us to know exactly what we're talking about so that book is getting finished and that's a big thing of what we're doing um, there's two, <laughs> there's two chapters left, um, maybe a month and a half, maybe a month and a half, hopefully, hopefully. Um, <laughs> uh, both, it'll be both. Uh, and also, unless I get, there's some possible publishers interested also, uh, in, in, apart from being just independently published. But it's meant to be for your back pocket, it's meant to give you power, it's not meant to be a cross-eyed slug, uh, even though it's philosophy and ideology. And then videos, and once, once the basis is there, the intellectual and, and uh, ideological basis is there, then it can start to become a media product. The other thing is that meetings like this Basically, local, uh, local area people, they each have a specialization and a special area, and it takes up all of our time. So uh, there's somebody who's, a, who's a brilliant at, uh, what is it, election interference and election disintegrity. And then there's somebody, a school board's person, and there's somebody who knows how to write your congressperson, things like that. Uh, we all need each other all the time. And so we are building regional chapters in, in every part of the country where these coalitions are, are rock solid. And basically it's coming back out of COVID, getting us back together because we don't have time to get to know one another and we need to know one another. So the settlement project has, is two, basically two things, to educate and to serve. And so anybody who has, who's doing any work whatsoever, the site, we, we invest in promoting your work. Uh, we, right now, for example, in, in LA, we have a, a chapter, a beautiful chapter that's flourishing. They are making huge headway into uh, turning the entire minority population of uh, LA into, um, from Democrat voters to Republican voters, based on values, by pointing out to the minorities that everything you're voting for with the Democrats is against what you believe in the a Asian Pacific community, the black community, the, especially the Hispanic community, they're so wildly family, and they vote Democrat down the block. And so basically, the settlement meetings there have, have 
made huge headway into altering all elections at every level, school board elections, et cetera, et cetera, by waking up the minority uh, community. So every region has its forte, its strength. Uh, and, um, and so we're building a national network. It's kind of post-pandemic work. We, we all love each other online, but we got to get back into each other's presence and back into driving, driving to each other's events and uh, writing a check. And the, otherwise, we're just complaining together. Uh, and so the, that's, what's make, that's what's making us have surprisingly huge success all over the place. Um, we have one in Columbus, Ohio. We're, we're, uh, we're setting up, we're gonna have a Southern California one, possibly right, right in the, you know, right in Mar-a-Lago, working on it. Um, and so, yeah, that's how we go. It's, it's to start to, sorry. Good, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And yes? Debbie's doing similar work here locally uh, along the same lines, almost like a local settlement project activity with the block with the gatherings and so forth. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's an honor to meet you and hear from you. Um, you said that Marxism is kind of dead. Well, in 89, Marxism has not really died. Well, he's offering you to hold oh, okay. it. Um, <laughs> Marxism has not died in 1989, 1990. It actually went underground and mm -hmm. rebranded itself. Mm -hmm. And I think it has emerged as a global Marxism or globalist Marxism, which is mm -hmm. on technocratic, and this is my author speaking here, on technocratic and fascistic steroids. Because the countries in the Western world are being run by a technocratic corporatist cabal. And as long as they stay in line, then the government allows them to exist above all else, smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses. Uh, so that is the new Marxism. Uh, and it, it has obviously fascist undertones. Absolutely. Until we come up with a new word to describe the two intermingled phenomena, I think that's what we have today. And they have all uh, spread at the exact same time uh, because I was telling somebody earlier the person who visited all the former Soviet satellite countries when they're Marxist governments fell in 1989 was George Soros with his NGOs. Mm -hmm. And they developed the curricula, and they printed the textbooks, and they also uh, gave them scholarships to go to universities in the West, so they're beholden to George Soros. I, I absolutely agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, at the level of the contemporary ideologues, the race theorists and gender theorists reject what they call meta-narratives and thus reject, they claim to reject Marxism. Although they retain its totalitarianism, they retain its fascism, they retain its dialectic, they retain its atheism, or not more than atheism, anti-godism. And so, it, it is the correct term other than, other than those people who swim in those areas, like, like these people who the Democrats call in front of Congress, these professors. They, they, have, they have such derision at, at the backward thinking when they're hearing language that they believe they're superior to. So I agree with you a thousand percent it's just, a it's just a language matter. The fullness of Marxism is, is co-present in, a, a in, in an equally virulent philosophical thread. I, thank you very much. I agree with you 100%. Time? Oh, yes, sir. We're talking about the CCP. Yes. And, oh, thank you. And 
My question is, when we in the West went to China in order to open it up, I guess, in the CCP era, so not, not, the, not the 1800s and so on, was there an honest belief that we could neutralize Maoism and Marxism through freedom and free markets? Or was it simply, well, look, that's a great place we could make a profit? And did they understand, did the people who led that effort, whether it's uh, President Nixon or otherwise, understand what they were facing with such a, an old society where a lot of these values were ingrained in some form? Brilliant uh, question. Uh, I, believe, I believe that the, those actors genuinely believed that uh, helping China open would be the way to create the world open for democratic society. It was a genuine belief, I believe. I believe that coterminous with all major international political activity are soulless, greed-addicted sharks that don't have anything, any other interest than just profit. And so, and so it came it came mixed, but I think the spearhead of it was a genuine, innocent, kind of the beauty of the Christian mind that people are respond to goodness and respond to opportunity. And I believe that they, they just had no idea what they were facing in terms of the Chinese mentality post-British post, uh, influence in Asia. That's how I would respond. Thank you very much.